Tonight, in the first ever politics hub, the crumbling concrete keeping children out of school. We'll speak to the Education Secretary, who today insisted, in an unguarded moment, that she's doing a great job to resolve the problem. Plus, a new frontbench for the Labour Party, Keir Starmer goes back to the future in a reshuffle that sees the Blairites moving up. We'll speak to the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. And a new term, but some familiar problems for the party leaders and the threat of new by-elections. All of that and more with our panel, the environmental campaigner Del Vince and the former Education Secretary Nikki Morgan, who are here to give their take for the next hour. It's Monday, I'm Sophie Ridge, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the very first edition of the Politics Hub. I'm going to be here weeknights at 7pm in what will be a blockbuster year for politics. And what a day to launch a political programme. I feel like there's been about three weeks of news in the last 24 hours. Just when you think the concrete crisis in schools couldn't get any worse for the government, Gillian Keegan has been caught on camera saying she's been doing a good job and it's everyone else who's been sitting around. She did use slightly different language to that as well. We'll have a lot of questions for the Education Secretary when she comes on this show in half an hour's time. Does she think parents would agree she's been doing a good job? Who is everyone else who's been sitting around, bearing in mind the last nine Education Secretaries have all been Conservative? And hand on heart, did she know she was being recorded? There was a big camera pointing at her after all. We'll try and get answers for you in our very first Politics Hub government interview. And we will, of course, be also trying to answer the questions that parents want to know too about how safe their children are in the classroom as they go back to school. Well, it's been a long day already for the Education Secretary and she hasn't got through it yet. Let's go straight into our top report by political correspondent Rob Powell. The Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, on the airwaves this morning, very much on message. So the first thing is to get get this get, get the schools open, get the minimise the disruption to education. But then, at the end of another interview, does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that. No. This mayor culpa quickly followed. Well, it wasn't really talked about anyone in, in particular. It was an off the cuff remark after. Um, the, the news interview had finished, or apparently after it had finished. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to apologise for my choice language. Uh, that was uh, uh, unnecessary. It comes as some blame for school closures starts to be directed towards the Prime Minister, with one former senior civil servant saying as Chancellor, Rishi Sunak cut school repair budgets. Are you to blame for what's happening now? And do you want to apologise to parents and pupils? No, I think that is completely and utterly wrong. Actually, one of the first things I did as Chancellor in my first spending review in 2020 was to announce a new 10-year school rebuilding programme for 500 schools. Now, that equates to about 50 schools a year that will be refurbished or rebuilt. And if you look at what we've been doing over the previous decade, that's completely in line with what we've always done. As MPs return to Westminster after summer, this heated row is the last thing the Prime Minister needs. The Education Secretary's unplanned intervention is definitely embarrassing, but the bigger political risk for the government is still that broader image of concrete potentially crumbling in schools and other public buildings. It's already being seized on by Labour as evidence as they see it of the result of 13 years of Tory rule. And looking at the figures for recent years, in 2020, the Department for Education said £5.3 billion a year was needed to maintain schools and mitigate safety risks. The department requested an average of £4 billion a year from the Treasury, but they were only allocated £3.1 billion a year, 40% less than the recommended figure. I think we would look back in shame. Teaching unions angry, more progress hasn't been made. We've got 22,000 schools in this country. When exactly, which, which century are we expecting to have the school estate fit for purpose for young people? I think lots of parents will listen to that, listen to the boastfulness of the Prime Minister, and they will think that what we've got is a government for whom education simply doesn't matter. Rishi Sunak chaired a meeting with his education secretary earlier and will publish a full list of schools affected this week. A problematic return from the summer break in more ways than one. Rob Powell, Sky News in Westminster. What a picture. Uh, let's talk now to Sam Coates, shall we, our Deputy Political Editor. 
probably going to come quite a familiar face to you on this show. You've been following this story. How bad are things looking for the government and education secretary? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons why it's really quite toxic uh, for the Tories at the moment. I mean, I think the first thing is it feels to me like it took some time for the government to wake up to just how incendiary this issue is. Parents have had their kids at home for six weeks, so thousands to be told that they were going to potentially be at home for longer. I think just really got to people, yet the government's response initially was to play down the number of schools, make it look like a small problem. I'm not sure that the tone was right, but really, a bigger thing is that this is a story of unforced areas, particularly involving the education secretary, Gillian Keegan, who on Thursday was saying that this was just about 156 isolated cases. No one else would be affected. Well, that's not turned out to be true. Then there was the swearing uh, incident that we talked about today. But the really difficult thing is playing out this afternoon in the Commons, where Tory MPs are starting to take on what Gillian Keegan has been saying on the airwaves. So Greg Smith is a well-regarded Conservative MP for Buckingham, and he's been talking to his local head teachers, and he says that there is no direct assistance for them to get temporary classrooms. They're being left to their own devices. That is really problematic. Yeah, putting aside the unguarded moment on camera that I'm sure you'll have seen, it is the detail, isn't it, yeah. of what parents and kids are experiencing. The other story of the day, which on any other news day, I feel like I would be leading off with you on. It, <laughs> yes. a, quite an extensive reshuffle by Keir Starmer. What, what's caught your eye? That's right. It's the first reshuffle that Keir Starmer's done since the autumn of 2021, the one that brought in Wes Streeting and, uh, and, and David Lammy. And so this is a big moment because it's who uh, essentially Keir Starmer's going to take into the election with him. Now, there's a return of some familiar faces who were first uh, in government under Tony Blair. Uh, quite a lot of Blairites are back. So uh, let's look at my report of the day. Ed Miliband, good morning. Reshuffle day, the, the most shadow anxious shadow time for any member of the Shadow Cabinet. Do you expect to stay in the Shadow Cabinet the, today? These are decisions for the, uh, for the leader. I used to have to make these decisions. I'd never liked uh, reshuffle days. This ex-leader knows how tough it can be to make the calls. And do you remember how hard these days could be? For the leader, very hard. <laughs> How are you? Oh, yeah. Very good to see you. Keir Starmer welcoming his latest new MP. Today, all about winning more of them. The first major rejig of his top team since 2021. He wants his party election ready. The question I've asked myself is, have I got really, really good, talented people in post and people hungry and determined to change our country for the better? And that's why I've put this team together. And I'm delighted to have put such a strong team together to face the country. The plans hashed out in the Labour leader's nondescript office are a mixture of reassurance and ruthlessness. A familiar face back on the front bench. Can I say to the Secretary of State that I look forward to working with him Hilary Benn immediately in action, hours after landing his new job as Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary. At a brutal demotion, former leadership contender Lisa Nandy shifted to Shadow International Development after a tense conversation with the man who beat her to the top job. That to create an opening for Angela Rayner. The deputy leader caused a meltdown in the last reshuffle, now moved to Nandy's old levelling up job with minimal fuss. Time is short before the next general election and Labour know that there are only a few moments between now and then where they can get through to voters to change minds. So getting the top team right is vital. Keir Starmer has decided in this reshuffle to prioritise experience, bringing back Hilary Benn, who first served under Tony Blair and also shown he's not afraid to pick fights with the left, bringing Liz Kendall, a reformer, to the welfare brief and Pat McFadden to run the election campaign. But do voters think this is enough to get their support? Shipley near Bradford. The last Labour leader to win here was Tony Blair. Can Starmer manage it? I've actually gone off the Labour Party for quite a while and then I just think now we seem to be getting it back as a la Labour leader. I don't see no difference between him and the Conservative Party. For me, he's making, he's making a better job than the Conservatives, definitely. Keir Starmer wants to convince the nation that he's a statesman, someone they can trust with their vote. Polls suggest he's on course to be the next Prime Minister. Is this the team to take him to power? Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster.
Now I'm delighted to introduce our very first Politics Hub guest, Wes Streeting, Shadow House Secretary, kept his job in the reshuffle. Congratulations, Thank I guess. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, I'm keen to talk about the reshuffle, obviously, but it feels like we should start with what is really the top story of the day, uh, which is the school's concrete crisis. Yeah. And Gillian Keegan being caught on camera saying she's done a good job, while other people have sat on there. Do you think she's got a point? She hasn't been Education Secretary for that long. I think people are looking for someone to take some responsibility for sorting this out. And I think she's misunderstood why people are angry about that off the cuff, you know, off those cuff, off the cuff remarks. It wasn't that she was effing and blinding. It was that she was basically saying like, hang on a minute, I've done such a great job. Why is no one thanking me? Which I, I've got to tell you, having met with my local head teachers before the summer about the pressure that they're under as school leaders will really stick in the throat for them. Schools are already under enormous pressure. Head teachers are really struggling to navigate their budgets and to start the term with this chaotic backdrop and then to see the education secretary saying, why isn't people thanking me, I think is an insult. I also think that after 13 years of Conservative government, there's probably no better monument to their failure than crumbling classrooms and school buildings literally being propped up and children missing out on the vital start to the school year because of the government's incompetence and the fact that over years now they've consistently made the wrong decisions, been really short-termist and it's stored up bigger problems and a bigger cost. And Rishi Sunak's in it up to his neck on this. At the this. same time though, this concrete was used in schools from the 50s right up until the 90s. I mean, the last Labour government obviously didn't, obviously didn't get rid of all of it either, did you? Well, we had the Building Schools for the Future programme with the ambition to modernise every school in the country. The Conservatives came in in 2010. Michael Gove scrapped the programme, later admitting it was a mistake and apologising. But Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, halved the school building's budget. So, uh, and, and when you're in government after 13 years, and I'm not saying this is all Gillian Keegan's fault personally, of course she'd been in the job five minutes, but she is part of a government that's been in for 13 years. So are you going to spend more money then than the Conservatives on this? Well, we are going to have to spend money on fixing the problem. There's no doubt about that. What so worries how much, us... How much money are you prepared to put into this? Well, what worries us at the moment is that we don't know precisely how many schools... That's not what I'm asking. And we don't know the size that's, of the bill. That's not but, what I'm asking. But, but the direct answer to your question, Sophie, is we don't know how much this is going to cost yet. And when we come on your programme and say, you know, and you put to us, will you fund this or will you spend on that? And we get this from campaigners and, and voters. Will you... One of the reasons why we're so cautious about spending commitments isn't just because the public finances are in the mess, but the price tag of solving so many of these urgent problems, it goes up and up and okay, up. OK, I'll ask, I'll ask it a different way then. Um, you're saying, you're talking about Rishi Sunak cutting money, you're talking about underinvestment over the last 10 years. Uh, let's have a look at the capital spending going back to 2010. You know, you praise the record of the last Labour government and you can see there how it's gone down. Uh, 2010, where Labour uh, was in power, up to 9.8, 9.2 billion, and that's gone all the way down to 4.9. So will yeah. you restore capital spending to what it was under the last Labour government? Well, I think that chart shows that people can judge us on our record, which is better than the so Conservatives. So why are you going to be restoring this money? It's about money, and isn't it? it? Of course it's about money, but also so you can understand why Rachel Reeves and her new deputy, Darren Jones, before they think about the wider capital programme for schools, the first thing that they're focused on today in relation to schools is what on earth is the price tag for sorting out RAC going to be? Because, of course, we are going to have to spend what it takes to make schools safe. There's nothing more important in terms of school capital spending than making sure that classrooms don't so fall into kids' heads. So will that be under a Labour government? Will whatever you say you will spend what it takes to make schools safe, would that come from the Treasury rather than existing education well, budgets? Well, I, I, think, I think it's one of the things that Rachel and Darren are going to have to work through. I can't through. answer these questions, though. It's because, because, Sophie, this isn't, this isn't, with respect, this is not our fault or our problem. I'm not saying it it's is your the fault. fault. It is, but it is, but it is the fact, Sophie, the reason I can't tell you what the bill will be today is because the Conservatives won't publish the number of... Or no, won't publish details of the schools affected, won't tell us the scale of the problem, won't tell us the cost of the problem. So, of course, I can't point to the figure that tells us how much it's going to cost and say, yep, yeah, we're going we're gonna to okay. fund that because we don't know. Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Education Secretary, has spent months with her colleagues tabling parliamentary question okay. after parliamentary question, trying to get the information out. So, you know, with respect, these are questions to put to 
to Gillian uh, Keegan. I hope she won't give you a four-letter answer, but, you know, these are problems that she's going to have to solve. And I dare say this is not going to be finished by the time of the general election. A Labour government on school buildings, as with so many other issues, is going to have to pick up the pieces. With your Shadow Health Secretary hat on, how worried are you that this concrete could have been used in hospitals? Well, it has been. There is rack in hospitals. I am worried about the government's hospital building programme in broad terms. I'm not convinced that it's a serious plan that I could just pick up and run with if we win the general election. I'm also concerned that on the hospital building programme, there are seven hospitals on the programme that have RAC, but there are others besides who also have RAC, where local MPs are desperately worried. Doncaster's a really good example, where Doncaster MPs are up in arms as to why their hospital isn't included. So, as with uh, the, the situation in schools and Bridget Phillipson pursuing Gillian Keegan, I'm having to do the same in the Department of Health with Steve Barclay because I want to be able to not just reassure myself but reassure patients and staff working in hospitals that, firstly, they're safe and, secondly, where they aren't, that there's, that there's a funded plan to deal with it. And at the moment, I'm not sure the government can give us those assurances, and that worries me. Uh, final question on this before we go on to the Labour reshuffle. Do you think Gillian Keegan will still be in her job in a week's time? It's hard to say, but if you think Gillian Keegan's having a bad day, ask Rishi Sunak whether he was right to halve the school capital programme when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Because when you've been in government for 13 years, as the Conservatives had, you can't duck and run for cover. You have to own your okay. choices and take responsibility. Let's see if Rishi does that. Um, so, Keir Starmer, reshuffled a shadow cabinet. These days are always laced with peril. You know, you think they're great reset moments, but there's always more grumpy people who think that they've been passed over or, or shunted out of government. How do you think it's gone today? Uh, I think it's gone very smoothly, and I think what Keir is focused on is making sure we've got a team that's not just ready to fight the general election, but ready to govern, because, you know, I, I, it's not just about making a political point when I say that, you know, for me personally, as the person who wants to be the country's next health secretary, but applies to colleagues, I'm really worried about what an incoming Labour government will inherit if we win the next general election. And there are some difficult choices to be made. And, you know, we want to make sure that it, across the board we've got the right people in the right places, and that's what the reshuffle you, was about. Can you name someone on the left of the party who's had a promotion today? Well, Angela Rayner's... Well, it's a, not, it's a sideways move, isn't it, really? Good, ex good example. But not... Well, uh, I think for the Labour Party, having someone like Angela, who is unquestionably one of our best campaigners, one of our most punchy media performers, taking the government on, mm -hmm. on one of the deep injustices of our country, which is so the she... North-South divide, the gap between rich and poor, and the fact that people don't even have decent homes to Important live Important job, sure. Sideways mood for Angela Rayner. Anyone else from the left of the party? Well, I think you'll see across the, the, the front bench consistently as Keir's been leader, he has sought to change the Labour Party from the worst defeat since 1935, which is what we suffered in 2019. So it's fair enough so I'm to, move, to move so the Labour Party I'm afraid, to I'm afraid to say that there have been a whole number of... I'm not even afraid to say, actually. Mm. I think it's a good thing that Keir has ruthlessly and single-mindedly gone through all those things that led to voters rejecting Labour at the last election and has eliminated every single one of them and built a foundation from which Labour can, can win a general election and be a great government that can turn the country around. You're still Shadow House Secretary. You're not going to get a promotion, are you? I don't want one. I, I was, I'm a cat. I was absolutely you're, you're delighted. You're as a future leader. I'm absolutely delighted. You've got a cap, to, I'm absolutely cap delighted. From where you're going to go. I'm, I'm, I, I, I can now say at this end of the day um, that I'm delighted to be staying on as Shadow Health Secretary. Uh, I hope to be the country's next health secretary. I can't think of a better way to spend my professional life than trying to turn around the NHS from its worst crisis in history to build an NHS fit for the future. It's a daunting task, it's a big challenge. Um, I would have been disappointed to get any other job, but of course, I would have done whatever Keir asked me to sure. do and sat here saying, yes, I'm really delighted. <laughs> but honestly, I'm genuinely <laughs> made up, so I'm absolutely delighted. Um, I just want to bring in uh, Dale and Nick at this point. Um, Dale, what's your take on the Labour reshuffle? Uh, <clears throat> it looked good to me. You know, uh, I think what Keir said about putting his strongest team on the pitch for the election, I think that's what it said to me when I looked at the players there. I think uh, Angie's a force of nature. I, I look at that as a promotion. I think that's a smart move to put her in that role for levelling up. 
um, you know, there was nothing not to like about it. I don't understand all the all the language around Blairites and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I really don't get that. All of that kind of um, factional stuff that the media tries to big up. I'm not sure that it really exists. So for me, that was, you know, not happening. And you must be pleased to see Ed Miliband staying in post as well. Yeah, Ed, Ed is fantastic at his job. I mean, he's passionate about uh, net zero and, uh, and green energy. So I think he's the best man for the job. I think Keir got it right. What was your take on Waza's comments there as well, uh, saying that actually it's fair enough that Keir Starmer has been moving the party towards the centre, making it more electable? Well, I think um, that's, the, that's the kind of aim of all political parties, isn't it, to be electable? Mm -hmm. And if, if that means you have to move to the centre, then that means you're listening to voters. So I don't see an issue with that at all. Nikki, successful reshuffle, you think, for Keir Starmer? Oh, well, that's uh, a matter for, for the Labour Party. I mean, I think as a member of another party, mm -hmm. we all enjoy in Westminster sort of fantasy cabinet, uh, fantasy shadow cabinet reshuffles. Well, everyone's had a go in your uh, party. So, uh, well, you know, it's uh, we like to obviously um, uh, spread opportunity around. So that's very much a conservative <laughs> uh, uh, a policy. Um, look, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. I mean, I think the fact is that um, if you are in position as Secretary of State, you know, who's shadowing you is of interest, but actually what you're focused on is the job in hand. And as you said, it's been a busy day and there's plenty going on for the government. Yeah, there is. We're going to talk about that with both of you later as well. Um, I just want to... that It's been a bit of a contrast between Rishi Sunak's reshuffle and Keir Starmer's. Do you think that Rishi Sunak's was a bit limited, I guess, when he could have offered a reset? Well, I mean, look, I, I don't know. I haven't spoken to number 10 about it, but I get the impression that last week was very much uh, perhaps a, you know, a first go, if you like, because of Ben Wallace having said as Defence Secretary that he wanted to, to move on. And then that obviously meant that uh, Claire Coutinho mm -hmm. um, it, it came in as, as Energy Secretary, I suppose, on the Sabbath. We're talking about this, isn't it? Is we're not going to talk about the energy bill probably tonight, and yet that's going to be a big thing in Westminster tomorrow. And Claire, who's brilliant, is going to have her first outing at the dispatch box. Um, I, I suspect there might be more, more to come in terms of reshuffles, but who knows? Who knows, uh, indeed. Um, really interesting to hear uh, from all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, right, here you go. Yes, lots more coming up on the Politics Hub today. I think if she were leader, the Tories would find life a good deal more difficult. Find out who Jacob rees Morgan is talking about. That is next. remember the atmosphere at the Shanghai protests. It was an electric mix of excitement, fear and defiance. It's hard to express just how incredibly unusual these scenes are in China. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. A massive Covid wave is sweeping this city, but officially almost no one has died. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. We found all the roads to one large cluster of facilities were blocked. Those we did reach were fearsome. My biggest challenge is adequately telling the stories of the Chinese people, even when the authorities would prefer me not to. Hey, hey, hey. By the rules, we are allowed to film in the streets. I can't tell if I'm moving it or it's moving me, but it's a very strange feeling. But those hills over there, that's Russia. Is this military ready? We are prepared to face every kind of challenge. The press preview, a first look at the front pages as they arrive. There's a feeling amongst some commentators that it's not the most respectful timing. I think there's a word for it, fake news. I mean, it's wah, wah, wah from Paris. Delving deeper into the stories with different perspectives on tomorrow's headlines. We really haven't seen the government getting round the table and negotiating. There are no easy answers to those questions. The press preview delivering you tomorrow's news tonight on Sky News.
Hello, welcome back. You're watching The Politics Hub. Every night, we're going to be giving you a front row seat on the latest political drama in Westminster. And it's a multi-platform offering. The Politics Hub TV is reflected on the Politics Hub website for Sky. And so we're going to try and check in at our physical hub as well so we can see exactly what is featuring uh, there as well. Now, a couple of things to pick out for you today. Labour reshuffle. We have all of the details of the winners and losers from the Labour reshuffle. So if you're a bit of a political geek like me, no shame in that, you want to know exactly who has been promoted, who's up, who's down, that is all there. Jennifer Scott, our uh, reporter. Plus, for a bit more analysis, uh, this piece on the mounting intray for the Prime Minister as MPs return to Westminster, the concrete crisis, migrant crossings, accusations of presiding over a zombie parliament. We're going to have an awful lot more on some of those challenges for the PM. Plus, if you scan the QR code, then you can catch up with all of the latest on the hub throughout the day. That's just at the bottom of your screens. Right there, underneath me, you can uh, scan that QR code. Very high tech here. Now, MPs have been returning to Westminster throughout the day, some sporting suntans that I'm sure were the result of extensive canvassing of their constituents over the course of the summer holidays. I took off my heels, put on my trainers and went out and about a little bit earlier to try and talk to some of them. So it's first day back of term, MPs coming back to Westminster. I thought I'd just come over to the House of Parliament to see if I can find anyone who wants to talk to me. I've got to ask about Labour reshuffle. I think Angela Rayner is very capable. I mean, I think if she were leader, the Tories would find life a good deal more difficult. Interesting. You can see Lib Dem leader Ed Davey doing a bit of a victory lap on the first day back after winning that by-election in Summerton and Freeham. I'll try and grab him after this interview. Hello, hi. Hello, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. First day back at term. How are yeah. you feeling? I'm really confident that we've just been celebrating the fact that Sarah Dyke is our newest MP after the Summerton and Froome by-election which I think shows the Liberal Democrats are back in the West Country. Looking forward to getting stuck in? Absolutely, and this is a, a really decisive day. We've just seen a really decisive reshuffle from Keir Starmer that is really now looking forward to the general election. Excited for the new term back in Parliament? I'm pleased to be back in Parliament. The Tories need holding to account. What do you reckon of the reshuffle? I want to look at the details of it uh, more closely. I think it's still a, a developing picture, but what's really important is that we hold the Tories to account, set up what we're going to do in government, because the general election could be sooner than people think. Well, let's bring in Nikki and Dale, uh, shall we? We heard a bit there from a few of the MPs coming back about what they think the priorities should be. I'm interested for both of you. You've got lots of issues that you've been campaigning on uh, over the years. Um, Nikki, what do you think the PM should be focusing on? Oh, my goodness me. I mean, what an injury he has. I mean, I think we're going to talk about maybe by-elections. Mm -hmm. That was one of your headlines. Um, obviously, he's got the party conference speech coming up, the King speech. And for any government, that's always a big thing because every department's putting in ideas, bids for legislation. You know, this is... Uh, going to be the last session before a general election. So an awful lot of my former colleagues, they will have spent the summer canvassing and they will come back with that real kind of... Um, a bit like when you're in the senior, the sort of top year at school. You know this is the, the final year. Not quite sure, you know, what's going to happen next. For me this week, the big thing is the online safety bill, returning mm. to the House of Lords. Um, the Commons next week, this is a huge piece of legislation, very important. I want to see it passed. You want to see it passed? It's interesting. So there has been some yeah. criticism of it. Yeah, no, it's, it's been... Um, I mean, it's, it's a new groundbreaking piece of legislation to regulate these social media platforms and search engines. Not easy. The government deserves credit for, you know, continuing with it. Um, but uh, it, actually, we've had some really good debates, uh, mm. particularly, I think, in the House of Lords, um, uh, cross-party, people working together to get the best mm. uh, out of it. So I really hope we'll see that, that uh, get royal sense soon. And uh, what, what issues for you? <laughs> I mean, the environment, I guess, is what we're expecting to say. I think absolutely the environment, net zero, uh, you know, avoiding the worst of the climate crisis, these things, absolutely. But uh, in, inherent in that is the economy. You know, mm. our, our country's on its knees. Uh, a poll published by uh, Lord Ashcroft just a couple of days ago, and he's a Tory uh, as well as a pollster, says that 70% of the public think that Britain is broken. Another 97% think that public services have got worse. And an overwhelming majority think this government is corrupt. We're in, we're in a mess. But what I wanted to say was that the economy is at the heart of all of the green measures that, that we need to undertake. If we invest in green energy, we get twice as much GDP growth as if we invest in fossil fuels and two and a half times as many jobs. And so the answer to all of the problems we face actually is a green transition. Do you fear that net zero is going to be rolled back on by both sides? Because you know, you've seen, for example, controversy over the ULAs. You've seen people saying, look, we love the idea of going green, but right now we've got to focus on cost of living. Yeah, I think it's a false narrative. 
Because the cost of living crisis that we have is driven partly by the uh, cost of fossil fuels and our absolute dependence on them. And the sooner we get off them, the better off we'll be. We can drive energy prices back down to a price they haven't been in for probably 10 years. If we make the switch to 100% green energy, we can grow our economy, create millions of jobs. We can do all of that kind of stuff and fight the climate crisis and make people better off. That's why it's a false narrative for Rishi Sunak and others to say we can't afford the green transition. Mm -hmm. Okay, Starmer on you, Lance. Are you disappointed about that? Well, no, I wasn't disappointed. Do you know what I think? I think both parties uh, came away from that by-election and said, oh, it must have been the ULEZ, right? And um, the Tories held the seat by 495 votes. Tony Blair never won that seat in his pomp. He never did, right? It's a, it's a solid Tory seat. So why do 495 votes mean it was a ULEZ issue? I don't believe it. We've commissioned some polling. We'll have results in a few weeks. Neither party has polling. Neither party has data, just um, mm -hmm. anecdotes from doorsteps. So we're going to have a look at that. Um, I was interested to hear you say about the election, right? Yeah. And do you think there's a landing zone for the Conservatives at the next election? It's yes, I'm mean, like, I saw you laughing there. Crash landing. <laughs> crash landing. <laughs> no, look, I, of course, look, any, any politician is going mm. to say that it's not over until literally the final, you know, ballot box has been shut and the, the votes are being counted. Yes, I think there is. What's really interesting, the feedback, and, you know, fascinating to see what today's Labour reshuffle does. Lots of people still say to me, we don't like Keir Starmer, we don't know very much about him, we don't know what he stands for. Um, and so I think there's a huge opportunity for the Conservative Party if they can be very clear about, you know, the missions that Prime Minister set and what he wants to do with them. Uh, lots more uh, with you later on, but up next, she's had a busy first day of term. The Edge of Taken Secretary uh, has been talking an awful lot today, defending the government's handling of the concrete crisis in schools, but there's still plenty of questions for her. You don't want to miss this next interview, because then on camera she had a go at her colleagues in pretty salty terms. She's rounding off the day on Politics Hub. Gillian Keegan is next.
Hello, welcome back. You are watching The Politics Hub. Now, one woman has been at the centre of the political story today, and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't sure she was going to turn up uh, today in the studio, but Gillian Keegan, Education Secretary, joins us now in the studio. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's start off by playing the clip that everyone is talking about today. But we will get a plan, and every single one of them will be done. OK, so you say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f good job because everyone else has sat on their ass and done nothing? No, no, no signs of that, no? So, do you think you're doing an effing good job? I, I wasn't talking about me, actually, I was talking about the department. The job that I was talking about started in March 2022, so way before I was in. But what the department's done since March 2022 is taken a completely different approach. So the way school buildings are managed in the country is through responsible bodies. So they have all the responsibility for school building, finding out RAC, doing the surveys, etc. And because of well, because of actually the leadership of Baroness Barron, uh, quite, quite specifically, as well as other Secretary of States, they and the department have basically taken on a full leadership role in surveying, uh, question, get, getting a questionnaire to find out where RAC is in the schools, surveying all the schools, getting all the porter cabins, getting everything, so that when we had these incidents over the summer, I knew what the where where the rack was so they had done all that work so when we had the incidents and we could look at it they so they have done i think a really good job this, if you did all this work why is it that parents are only being told that there could be let's let's not beat around the bush here concrete ceilings collapsing in in classrooms days before they're going back to school i mean does that sound like a good so job? you have to work on new evidence so as you know i've you know, spent many, many years in business. And uh, that was an off-the-cuff comment, by the way, as well, which was, as you realised, I thought the interview was over. So I apologise for my choice language. But the the, the reality is the, the job that I we... Don't think, I don't think people are upset about the choice of language. I think people are upset about the complacency, the tone that... There's no why, complacency. Why, it, why aren't people thanking us for the great job we've done? When parents no, are it, worried I wasn't about talking, the No, I, I was school. not talking about people. It was the journalist. So, basically, in the interview, if you listen to the interview, I don't know if anyone will now, the journalist was like, why haven't you done this in 2018 or, you know, way before I was even doing this? So, well, Daniel Hewitt isn't responsible for it, is it? No, but what I said is actually the department has taken a huge leadership role. So, they're not the responsible body for schools, but we have taken a role to really help schools, and I think... No, they're not the responsible body for schools? What, what do you mean? They're not the, 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 the responsible body for school buildings is the local authorities or the multi-academy trust. But you're but responsible what... for multi-academy trusts, aren't you? The Department but, of Education, but right? Everybody has a different role. Right, but that's so, correct, so, isn't it? You're, you're responsible for multi-academy yes, trust. Yes, but the, so you are responsible for. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> everybody has different responsibilities. You, right? Are you saying that you're not responsible for the safety of children in the classroom? Absolutely, I am. Which is why we took a completely different approach that we've ever taken, that we've taken, and actually that every other country has taken, and probably we've taken in our history. So we have uh, gone out directly to. to First of all, in 2018, we put warning notices out and asked the responsible bodies to do surveys. Then we put guidance out and said, look, you need to go and do guidance on RAC and tell us where the RAC is. And we didn't think it was going quickly enough. So we then took a more direct role, which is the first time we've done it, which is sending out questionnaires to 22,500 schools, arranging for surveyors to go in. So we've now contracted eight building survey companies and then arranging to mitigate, which is getting porter cabins in and getting the propping in. That's something that we don't usually do. Usually the local authorities or the multi-academy trust not, would do that. I'm not sure about talking about how the problem first emerged in 2018 is helping your argument. I mean, that's five years ago. The new evidence that came over the summer, which is why we changed the policy, is three cases that came up over the summer. Um, and and we first, one of them was actually in a commercial building. One of them was in an education setting outside of, uh, of our jurisdiction and the other one was a school in England. And what happened in those cases is there were ceilings that were assessed or would have been assessed as non-critical and they had a failing panel. So that was the new evidence we got. So that came over over the summer? Yes. There, there were three different cases. Three different cases over the summer. You were aware of the summer that children were in this situation, right? Ceilings, dangerous, parents worried about the classrooms, concrete collapsing. 
Well, no. You it... went on a holiday in Spain from August the 25th to August the 31st. Was that a mistake? Well, when I went on holiday, I mean, to be honest, for the whole of the summer, um, obviously I had to sort out industrial action, then I had to do the A-levels, then I had to do the GCSE. So the first time I could go on so holiday... So we should, be, we was should that, feel sorry for you. Not at you. all. And I don't expect anyone to feel sorry for me. I'm certainly not getting that vibe from you. But what um, I said uh, was... What I arranged was to go on holiday that day for my... Well, for my parents, mm -hmm. my dad's birthday. Um, so it was a family occasion, we went. I said to them, right, um, we'd, we'd, we'd seen some of the evidence We'd, we'd, I said, we have to speak to the inst institution of structural engineers. I'll take my... I, I've always worked remotely. I mean, I've, you know, nearly 50 years before I got elected as an MP, I've always worked remotely. Uh, I, chaired, I chaired... I chaired... Well, I re worked remotely on holiday as well. I chaired the gold uh, team from there every day, mm -hmm. um, made the decision, and I said, if, there's, if it looks like we're going to make a decision, that we we get something back from the you know from the from these investigations and it looks like we will um, do that then I'll just come back and I, I came back straight away well actually I came back straight away but I had to wait a day because of the uh, uh, air traffic control okay. issue. Um, I just want to show you the reaction of a teacher in Leicester when Sky's Becky Johnson played her the video of you from earlier. Let's just listen to this, look at this teacher. Oh my goodness! And that's our education secretary using that language. For the situation. What I would like to say is, please, Gillian, come and see my school. I worked from the moment we got the notice of closure in order to make things work. I am horrified and disgusted by what I've just seen. What would you say to her? Um, I wasn't talking about her at all. She's done an amazing job and everybody in the schools. So when I said the people who've done an amazing job, it's the Department for Education, the local authorities who have responded to the questionnaire, which is 95% of them, the schools that have acted very quickly, the school leaders that have acted very quickly, the propping companies, the, um, the companies that have provided the porter cabins, they are the people who've done an amazing job. It was very difficult to make this decision. This wasn't a decision. I know that for parents and for children, it was a nightmare timing, but you only get the new evidence when it happens. It was a very difficult decision to make. I made the decision because I put the safety of children first, and the people who've done an amazing job are people like that, that you know, that head teacher there. What I am frustrated about, and it is frustrating, is we still have about five... So we've been trying to get these questionnaires since March 2022. This is the start of the process where we can then send surveyors in if RAC is identified. It's now become even more pertinent because we've now changed non-critical to um, needing mitigation straight away because of these incidents over the summer. Um, and about 5% of them haven't yet responded. And we've written time and time again. We've set up a call centre to call them. We've written again today um, and said they have to respond by the end of the week. And, you know, there's about, about 700, 750 schools. And we okay. need to get that because I want to make progress. I want to get children back into the classroom. Okay. I want to keep them safe. I've made a difficult decision. It is the right difficult decision. And I also... You said the language wasn't the problem. I also want to apologise to her because, like my mother, okay. she also didn't like the language. In the video, you also referred to everyone else who was sitting around on their... And I'm just wondering who you're talking about. You know, you say you're not talking about teachers. The last nine education secretaries... Oh, I definitely wasn't talking... ..were all conservative. No. I, wasn't talk a... I wasn't talking about... I mean, including Nicky Morgan. Are you talking about Nicky Morgan? No, not at all, not at all. But is this... she sitting around not doing enough? Not at all, but this has been a problem since 1994. And, you know, the reality was, basically, it was the interview... It was the interviewer. It was the interviewer. Should you have done a bit more? Well, there's always been an issue about... Um, we know there's an ageing school estate in the country and there have been successive, you know, whatever party, education secretaries, putting in bids to the Treasury saying we need more for, for capital building. And I'm sure Gillian will know, all education secretaries or whatever party know, the Treasury never says, yeah, have everything you've asked for. Yeah, on that, are you going to be pushing for the Treasury for this to be new money or are you happy for it to be taken from existing education budgets? Well, there's three parts to it. So the first is the mitigation, so the money's for... For uh, the surveys, for the prop in, for the yeah. uh, spare classrooms. Um, so we're paying for that uh, for the DFE. The second is if there's any revenue funding. So some of the schools, by the way, the vast majority of schools in our country but, but, do not have look, RAC. I haven't got, I haven't the vast got, majority of kids went back to down. Are you, is this going to be from the existing education so the budget, or are you asking for more money from Jeremy Hunt? So, what is going so on? So we have money for capital and. Uh, come on, for, uh, uh, like, what's the answer? 
There's three parts of it. If you want to know the answer, because I can tell you in detail budgets, the first part of it is will come out of our capital budget because we have a capital budget yep, for repairs and budget, maintenance. Yeah. And that will be for the uh, mitigation. Okay. Is there going to be money from the Treasury? The revenue funding will also come out of our budgets because right. we get budgets okay. every year for building. But what about the third part? For is building that maintenance. Also, school budget. The third new... part of it, we will have to put together how much refurbishment and how much of it is oh. new money. But the Treasury has said, and, and Jeremy uh, said yesterday when he was on uh, Laura Coonsberg's okay. show, that you do whatever it, it takes to keep uh, Sounds to me safe. like it's going to be education, a pump for education budget. Well, no, because we have our capital okay. budget up until the end of this spending review session, and would this you, will go beyond that. Would you apologise to parents and pupils who can't get back to school? Well, of course, I never wanted to make a decision. So you, you would say sorry to I, them? I said, actually, at the beginning, I did not want to put, put anything in the way of pupils going back to Will school. Will you apologise? But when, but when I got new evidence, I had to take action. Will you apologise? I had to take action, Sophie, so... No. I do not... Yeah, of course, I do... I don't... I'm really sorry that they're missing school. Not many of them are, by, by the mm. way. We've got 22,500 schools. We're talking about Thousands. 156, Thousands actually. Thousands of children. 156, no, not all of them. Most of them have been mitigated. So 52 have already been mitigated. 104, which will also be um, mitigated. But what I've said is I want to minimise the damage to children. But if you get evidence of a ceiling that comes to you towards the end of August, and then you get it so looked at, and it looks like this was a non... It would have been non-critically assessed, and a panel could go loose, that is information you have to act on. And by the way, politically, it's not been a very easy thing to act on because Just, I didn't want to do this right at the beginning of term. I would have done anything not to, but I do think prioritising safety is the most important point and I wouldn't apologise for that. I just want to... There's so much I could talk to you about, but we're, we're running out of time. But just as a takeaway from the interview, do you think that some of the frustration is about the tone that you take? in these interviews, you know, w w when you're talking about, because there's a small number of children, um, or when you're saying that, look, you know, we've been doing loads, we've been working really hard. I just like to really put things hard. in context. I just like to put things in context, because if you listen sometimes to the media, you'd think every school was closed with RAC. We've 22,500 schools, that. there's 156. We're talking about crumbling concrete that's been known about for decades and that is shutting schools because of a risk to life. That's what we're talking because about. Because of new evidence that came up over the summer where ceilings that had been assessed as non-critical, okay. a panel... That's the first time we have evidence of that. Now, what we have been doing is we've been searching for all of these cases. That's why we found a case in the commercial sector. We found a case in school in another country. I sent the engineers up there to look at it. We've been okay. actually actively searching for rats because I want to get this sorted okay. because I want to keep children safe. That's the number one priority. And I think we have been very proactive now and we have put all of the information okay. together. You know, it is very unfortunate, the timing, and I really, you know, I, it's the worst thing to, to you know, have the, any more impact on children. Okay. Um, you know, they've had COVID, etc. We will work to minimise it and we will make sure that most children are in school okay. as soon as possible. Thank you for coming on the show. You've fronted up to the questions. You've been on. You've been here. You've answered the questions. Thank you, um, Nikki Morgan. You were Education Secretary. W what's your take on this? Well, I think this is every Secretary of State's worst nightmare. Again, doesn't matter, you know, which party they're from or anything else. You yourself have just said, Sophie, that this particular issue has been known about for, for decades, but it's been obvious that obviously you have an ageing uh, school estate, despite the fact there has been significant new building in the course of the last uh, decade or so. Uh, you know, it's just a fact that schools are going to, uh, going to age. Um, and actually, I think Gillian has taken the decision, which is the most... The worst thing would be for any Secretary of State to come on national television and have to say sorry for the injury, serious injury or, or worse, of a child or a teacher. Of course, with all of this, it's about the handling of, of this particular situation. And I will say what Gillian perhaps uh, won't say, which is that the Treasury absolutely has to cover the costs of this now. And Jeremy Hunt, he said what he said yesterday about uh, we're going to spend all that it takes. He has to make it clear to the Treasury <clears throat> officials. And in the Treasury, there is a spending team that mirrors every department. And they will be saying for a long, long time, no, we're not going to give this money for capital that everyone's been asked for. Now, I'm afraid, the answer is yes. How much is it going to cost? What are the surveyors estimating? How quickly can we pay to get this sorted? OK, really interesting. Uh, we'll have more after the break. Thank you for being on the programme. Gillian Keegan, Education Secretary.
Lots more coming up on the politics hub, including by-elections after the first day back at term. Another two votes are looming over the government. We'll have a very own John Craig on that. I'm Hannah Thomas-Peter, and I'm Sky's climate change correspondent. The UK is a world leader in wind power. Basin rainforest, which is such an important ecosystem, it's known as the lungs of Africa. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. She doesn't really enjoy speaking to the press, and it wasn't clear right up until the last moment that she was going to sit down with me. I might be just very naive, but I do believe that change is possible, otherwise, we wouldn't be climate activists. I'm confident for the last 30 years we have known how bad it is. I'm not here to apologize, I'm here to fight for the next step. You can see just the piles and piles of stuff, these, these sofas and people's desks and children's books. And you can see inside this home here, people trying to, uh, to sort out their home. It's just been devastating. I think everything's at stake. The future of our planet, the future of the beauty around us, the future of you and me. Welcome back. You are watching the Politics Hub. We are joined again by uh, Dale and Nikki. Dale, I know you were itching to say a few things <laughs> after before that break, so it's time now to get it off your chest. Thank you. Busting. I was busting to say something because I listened to that uh, very carefully and all I could hear was a refusal to take responsibility from both Conservatives in the room and no, no disrespect. Because uh, Gillian contradicted herself, uh, actually. Uh, you must have noticed. She said this was new evidence in the summer and then she said it's been a problem since 1994. Oh, that's rubbish, Dale. Come on. That's what on. she said. No, no, no but that's, that's what she said. Play the tape that. back. No, that's no, what no, she said. She... Let me finish anyway. It's my chance to speak. I won't interrupt you, I promise. I'll give you a chance to Well, I'll come back on this, because I think that's very unfair. And, and why do we have to wait until there's a crisis in our schools before we properly fund them? The end point being made was, look, it needs funding, we're going to have to do it. Well, Rishi Sunak ne knew that it needed funding two years ago when he was Chancellor. The DfE made what they said was a very good case, a well-argued case, to fund the repairs of three or 400 schools every year. He promised to do 100 and then cut the budget to 50 when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. The Tories have left this until the last minute. And this idea of new evidence in the summer? I'm not buying it. What new evidence? There was a school roof in Kent in 2018 that collapsed and would have killed people had they been in the room that collapsed over a weekend. So the unreliability of this material and the fact that it doesn't give warning signs before it collapses has been known for five years. So this last minute new evidence, followed by a holiday, as you pointed out, I'm just not buying any of it. Why, why is it the, the first day of a, of a return to school that 150 schools can't open? Nikki. Well, I think it's easy to say that if you've not been a Secretary of State making those kinds of decisions uh, and actually being responsible for talking to the Treasury about trying to extract money from them, which is no easy process. Also, um, West Trutton didn't commit to more money either, did he? They well, didn't. The funding would... under the last Labour government, capital spending was twice as high. I'm answering Sophie. Mm, twice yes. as high okay. under a Labour government. Twice okay. as high. Well, 
OK, so the, the, the fact is, at the moment, Gillian's done, uh, as I say, she's done the right thing, the only thing that a Secretary of State could do when oh, yeah. safety is paramount no and argument. say, actually, now the timing may be terrible, mm. and I completely understand for families and for the right. schools themselves, this is, this is not good. I'm gonna, you guys are going to have to well, keep this going off-air. There's a, <laughs> you can go and chat off-air, OK? Um, very lively discussion. Uh, now we've had another apology this evening. I accept the decision that my conduct constituted a breach of the bullying and harassment policy and have since reflected on my behaviour. I reiterate my apology made to the complainant following the breach. I apologise to them again now and I apologise to the House fully and unreservedly. I will do my utmost to ensure this does not happen again. Recognise that man, Gavin Williamson. Let's talk to our chief political correspondent, John Craig. What a day, John. John's in central lobby where all the action is. What's going on? Well, let me tell you what that was about, first of all. It was a dispute over uh, Sir Gavin not getting a seat in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, for the funeral of Her Majesty the Queen last September. I counted, he sent a series of texts, I counted four four-letter words there, sort of language that might even make Gillian Keegan blush. Uh, but the threat was, uh, don't forget I know how this works, there's a price for everything. Well, that came an hour or so ago, the House is still sitting, but the day kicked off today with the three by-election winners yeah. from late July, that was Keir Mather, Steve Tuckwell and, uh, and Sarah Dyke taking their seats. Too many Keirs, said uh, Sir Lindsay Hoyle to Mr Mather. And then we had the Ritz for two by-elections. That's Rother Glen and uh, Hamilton West. That looks as though it's going to be on the 5th of October. And then mid-beds, Nadine Dorries' old seat, looks as though that will be on the 12th or the 19th. So, by-election frenzy to come in the weeks to come. By-election frenzy. You kn we know why you're smiling there, John. John Craig loves a by-election. That is all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow, but we're going to leave you with some other public figures in hot water.